You know, I don't know whether the title of the sermon today, which is Does God Meddle, meaning does God intervene in our lives, I don't know whether it actually still fits the sermon I'm going to preach or not because during the night, my whole sermon shifted while I was asleep. And I'm not sure how that happens, but I got up this morning with a different, somewhat different sermon with similar illustrations. And uh, so I'm going with that. I don't know whether it's better or whether it's worse. I just know that's where I ended up this morning. Between now and Easter, well, it's not just between now and Easter. You come to church and you hear some remarkable stories and some of them sound unbelievable. Some of them sound unbelievable. But if you're familiar with, um, <laughs> with some things in science, the truth is science now has discovered that things that are unbelievable in science apparently are true. Someone said, uh, I can't remember exactly what the thing was about quantum physics, the, 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 the statement was actually something like, there is no one who actually understands what is going on in quantum physics because it doesn't actually make sense if what we know about the world is the old Newtonian physics. Quantum physics takes us into a world where science actually cannot figure things out. So the fact that something is very strange and seems unbelievable does not mean that it is true. So one thing we're going to do this morning, we're going to look at three questions that we're going to ask when we are confronted by any kind of information because we're living in a time when there is a whole onslaught of information and much of it untrue. One thing our communication systems, including our computers and all of that, have made available to us, you know, it used to be, what did they say? Uh, a lie can run around the world while the truth is still just getting up and putting its shoes on. Well, now a whole bunch of lies can run around the world all at the same time, and not only can they do that, they do all the time. And we must be people who know what questions to ask about the information that comes to us. And in the church, uh, by, frankly, I'm always bringing you stories that may on the surface sound unbelievable. Some of them come from scriptures. I'm going to read you one right now. Here it is. This is from the 12th chapter of the book of Acts, which was written by the blessed Luke. He wrote the gospel of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. And uh, the Acts is the story of the early church. A lot of, most of it is about the apostle Paul, but before he gets to Paul, and even a little bit after he gets to Paul, he talks a little bit about the other disciples too. And here's a story about Simon Peter. Simon Peter, and of course this is after the resurrection, this is in the early church, and Simon Peter has been locked up in jail, and Herod is about to bring him out for uh, some kind of show trial and deliver him uh, to be killed. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get up quick, he said. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter was out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. 
He thought that he was seeing a vision. I'm sure he thought he might just be dreaming. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It appeared for them, it opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of the street, suddenly the angel left Peter. And Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. An unusual story. Here's what I'm going to suggest that we do with, with any information that comes to us. Do you trust the person telling this story? I do trust Luke. Luke was a storyteller. Uh, he, uh, he may have exaggerated a little bit from time to time. I don't know whether he got every bit of that information exactly right, but the truth is uh, I do trust him to tell us what's going on, but we need to ask that of people. Do I trust this person? Because some of the people that are talking to us today, uh, if you look them up in the dictionary, you're going to find a liar right beside them. And that's coming at us all the time. And, and people know they're liars, but still, even though everybody knows they're a liar, they still follow them and believe them. You know that's going on. But when, we, when information is before us, we ask, do I, do I trust this source? That's the first one. The second one is the evidence for this strong or is it weak? Is it strong? Is it there? Is there enough evidence to believe this or not? Well, the truth of the matter is there are several things in this account in the book which strike me as representing the kinds of experiences that other people have had. That angel and that light. I know the story of a man who was in a prison and he had, uh, he had given up. His life, he felt, was wasted. And the jailer had put him in solitary confinement just to see if he could break him. And the gentleman was saying, I was, I was broken. And I was about to cry out to the jailer and tell him I was broken. But he said, instead, for the first time in my life, I cried out to God. And he said, I was sitting there in the total darkness on that slab in my prison cell. No light. I knew I was going to be getting only one meal a week on Sundays. And every, every day during the week, I'd get a, a piece of bread and a glass and a, and a cup of water. And he said, and I was sitting there. I looked at my hands. And I saw light on my hands and he said and then the room was flooded with light and suddenly he said I felt something I had never felt in my life before he said I felt love he said his mother left him when he was three years old and his daddy never wanted him and he felt love real love for the first time in his life, and he knew this was God. He had never read a word of the Bible, knew nothing in there, but he knew this was God filling that room with light. And he said, I didn't care when they let me out of there. He said, I could have stayed there forever in that light and in that love. And his whole life was transformed. To me, that's a very similar story. So that's the second thing we asked. Does this, is there other evidence for this kind of thing going on? Is this the only person who had this experience or do other people have those experiences? When I had my experience at 12 years old and I, uh, I heard a voice tell me, I heard you. That's a, that's a strange story. I'm aware when I tell people that, that that's a strange story. <laughs> but have other people had that experience? Yes. When I published that in the newspaper once, the uh, woman who had been pastor of uh, 
Jefferson Universalist Church over here wrote me a letter. And she said she was there, she had children, she was the pastor of the church. She felt alone. She didn't know whether she was doing a good job. She just felt out of place. And then she said she heard a voice. Now, I'm not exactly sure what, what it said. I, uh, it, it was something like, uh, we are glad you are here. That's it. She woke up that morning. She heard a voice say to her, we are glad you are here. <laughs> now, God has a sense of humor. With Unitarians, there is no we. There's no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> she was still puzzled by this after she knew that this was a reality. She got up, she looked around the room, she looked under the bed. There was nobody there. She had had this word from the Lord. Yes, good news. God loves Unitarians too. So she wrote that to me. And I told her I wanted to put it in the book. And she said, I, I said, but for your protection as a Unitarian, I'll change your name. So I changed her name when I put that in the book. But that's an unusual story. So I find there are many stories like my story in which God does intervene in our lives with a direct and a personal word. God said to me, I heard you. God said to her, we are glad you are here. A personal word from the Lord. We learn so much about God just from those things. The last thing we asked, does this now fit your view of the world? You've already asked, do you, do you consider the source reliable? Well, I think when God speaks to you, you've got to consider it reliable. Uh, I did. Uh, is this source reliable? You have to ask that if you hear it from some other person or you read it in the paper or you see it on the internet. Is this source reliable? Is this somebody I can trust? Or is this somebody who's going to lie to me? And the second thing you ask after you say, is, is this a reliable source? We ask the question, is there sufficient evidence for us to believe this? And then you see if there's enough evidence. And the third thing you ask is, does this fit my view of the world? Does this fit the way I think the world operates? Or if it's something spiritual, does this fit the way I think God operates? And in all of the instances that I've mentioned to you, the scripture, the gentleman in the cell who saw the light, me hearing the voice, the other minister hearing the voice, these do fit my understanding of the way God works in the world because it is my understanding that God does break into our lives sometimes in quite extraordinary ways. Now, I do receive, should receive, I don't know, should I receive bonus points for what I've done lately, or should I simply be written down as an idiot? I have, I put in the paper, in the newsletter, but also in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, a couple of stories that uh, are challenging for anyone to believe. But I asked these three questions about it and I came up with an affirmation on each one of them. I trusted the source. I found out that there were other stories like it. And it does fit my understanding of the way God works. I'm going to reshare one of those with you right now. One of them was the one I put in the paper this week. And you may recall it or you may not. I actually depend on you being very forgetful. That allows me to repeat things from time to time, okay? Um, this, this is, the, and I, I do trust the source on this because if people, if people tell me their deepest experiences and, uh, and I know them, figure they're not a liar, and there's no particular gain for them in telling that story, then I say, this is someone that I can probably trust. And then I start asking the question, is there sufficient evidence for this? Can we look at other places and find other stories like this? And in doing that with this story, I have come to the point where I believe this happened, as strange as it is. 
Now, I'm talking about strange stories because on Easter Sunday, we're going to tell you a story that is extraordinarily strange, and there are a lot of people who don't believe it. But I'm going to tell you on Easter Sunday that they don't believe it because they have not sufficiently looked at the evidence. Anyone who looks sufficiently at the evidence on the Easter story is going to believe it. It is a strange story. It's one of the strangest stories that has ever been told. But if you hear a strange story that doesn't fit what you already know, you may have to adjust what you know about life and even about God. Well, this is a story of a fellow who was a, uh, he was a personal trainer. He had... Uh, uh, he was well known as a personal trainer. He had appeared on ABC News. He had been on Oprah. Of course, Oprah's had a lot of nuts on there too, but I don't think this guy was one of them. And uh, he, he uh, had appeared on, on PBS. Now listen, children, if you're on PBS, you know you're, hitting, you're in high cotton there. All right? Been on PBS uh, several times. And... Uh, this guy told a story that he knew already would be hard for people to believe, but he told it anyway because he says it happened. He lives in New York. He rides a bicycle everywhere. I know why. I've been to New York. I drove into New York. I drove into New York, and I drove out of New York, and I'm alive to tell you about that. When I was driving from Connecticut into New York, I passed a place along the road where there were four taxis, four taxis in the middle of the road, all facing each other, seeing who would give way first. They were that way when I pulled up and when I left the traffic light. New York is a crazy place to drive, but I drove in, saw what I wanted to see, and got out there alive. So I, can, I, I know why he rides a bicycle everywhere that he goes. He was late for a meeting that morning because he said he always tended to overschedule. And he was trying to get to this meeting and he was pedaling as fast as he could. And as he looked ahead, about 60 feet in front of him, he saw a father and a little girl just in his mind. It flashed into his mind. She was probably about three years old. And they were standing beside the road, beside the bike path. And he was pedaling on. But just before he got to them, the child darted out right in front of his bicycle. I mean, it was when he got so close, he could not respond at all. And the child was in front of him. And the collision was inevitable. But there was no collision because he and his bicycle moved right through the child or the child moved through him and his bicycle, he says, or both at the same time, whichever. And he went on for a little bit and stopped and looked back. Uh, astounded, shaken, yes. And the father was there. And he looked at the father and he knew he didn't know what to say to him. The father didn't know what, wouldn't know what to say to him. He, in his confusion, he just rode on. He wished he had stopped and talked to the father. But it was too late then. And the child simply went back playing with the flowers along beside the road. I became interested in stories like this when I heard a woman who told me this herself. A friend of mine told me about this woman. I talked to her on the phone. They had been in England. And a lorry, a truck, had appeared right in front of them. And they didn't hit the truck. They didn't have the inevitable accident. They went through the truck. They even saw the color of the guy's red plaid shirt as it passed through. Now I ask myself, do I trust these sources? I do trust that woman. I trust this guy here to be telling what, what he believes happened. But do I have other instances of this? Yes, I have six or seven instances of this, including from the actor Val Kilmer, who, could, who said this happened to him. And of course, most people pay no attention to it because the story is too crazy. 
But I'm interested in crazy stories that might be true. Because I'm in the business of one big crazy story that a lot of people don't believe. It's that story that's coming up on Easter. And by the way, when this guy went through that child, he said something funny, something you hear from near-death experiences. He said it to himself just as he passed through. He said, well, I already knew this. In other words, in that moment, in that brief moment, because God had actually lifted that whole situation beyond this earth and into that deeper world where we do know everything. He said, well, I know what's going on. But then after he got through, he no longer knew what was going on. He doesn't know what he was referring to. People who have, people who have near-death experiences say, I suddenly understood everything. Everything made sense. Everything seemed just right. I recognize that a characteristic of significant experiences. This guy was profoundly changed by this. After all, after this, he knew that there was a God because only God could have done this. Only a God who is willing and able to intervene profoundly and marvelously and awesomely in our lives from time to time. And the truth is you and I have no idea how often God has intervened in our lives when he saw things going in a way that was not his way. I know a lot of children die and a lot of people die, but it was not God's intention that that child die on that day or that he have this hanging over him for the rest of his life. And he was so grateful. He was so thankful that he did not have to bear this burden for the rest of his life. We're coming to Easter. And I am particularly interested in these stories because I know something. God has created the world in such a way that God can intervene in the world and in our lives and never has to break his own rules. When this guy and his bicycle went through that child, it was, listen, I only know enough physics to be slightly dangerous, okay? I'll try not to be dangerous. But every, every atom, every proton, every neutron, every, every, every element of matter has both a solid function and a wave function. Every piece of matter can be either solid or a wave, I know that sounds crazy, and waves can go through each other and solid can't. And in that moment, the solid moved to the wave function. Some people who had this experience say, both vehicles and the people in it just fuzzed out, became fuzzy. And I don't know how you see the resurrection of our Lord. The resurrection of our Lord, people have weird ideas about that, childish ideas about a resuscitated body about Jesus being there and dead and then the spirit entered back into him and he got up physically and walked out of the tomb. No. The body disappeared. The, the elements of that body just disappeared. And that cloth which was over him and under him fell down through the body. We actually don't know when this happened. May have been early after he was crucified. Why would God actually wait three days? The discovery was three days later. Does all this fit my worldview? Yes, it fits my understanding of the way God works. And here's another thing. God has left sufficient evidence for us to believe in the resurrection 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does this mean? It means it is true if we believe it. That he died for us. He suffered immeasurable pain personally for you and me and continues to suffer it because of our continued sin. And God so loved the world, he not only gave his son, he gave himself through Jesus Christ for us in love of us. We are loved beyond measure. And we need to reach that point where we can say with that guy who was sitting in the cell, I know I am loved and I feel at home in that love and I can be lifted from my fears and my sorrows just by knowing that I am loved and God is with me in every moment. Join me in prayer. Dear gracious God, bring us to the point where we can feel, not just feel your love for us, but feel the wonder of that love. If we're not feeling it right now, then we're asking you to bring us to the point sometime today or tomorrow or this week or sometime where we can feel in awe before your love for us and be amazed at your work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.